Question. Is passion a good thing, a bad thing, or does it depend? Don't, don't rush, don't answer so quick. Listen, listen, listen for a while, just for a little bit. You'll get your chance. You can scream at the computer all you want as long as you don't disturb me, but hang in there. Let me develop the idea and you'll understand the perspective of the question or the context of the question. Story one. The Tzemach Tzedek was sitting by a Tish and Shvuas with a group of the greatest Rabbonim in Russia. And one of the Hasidim said to the Tzemach Tzedek, how does he imagine Moshe Rabbeinu looking at the moment the Yamsov split? When the sea split, when that great miracle occurred and the sea split, and of course in Kabbalah it wasn't just the sea, it was the whole universe, the whole Ishtashalus, as it's called in the Chazal, all the waters in the world split. And everything was open. You could look up and see God. What was Moshe Rabbeinu doing at those moments? Said the Tzemach Tzedek, it is given Kaltenbrand. Kaltenbrand means hot ice, which means Moshe Rabbeinu was in a state of incredible passion that was entirely internal, completely non-demonstrative. If you looked at Moshe Rabbeinu, he could have been a marble, a statue of ice. And in fact, inside, the, the fire of attachedness was, if you will, beyond passion, beyond demonstration, beyond being showy. Second story. It is known that the middle Rebbe had the capacity to go into a dvekus, into a trance, into a concentration, where he was literally not aware of anything around him. He was, for all intents and purposes, not in this world. And when he would go into these trances, whatever position his body was in, it would remain in, and he was completely without, outside of that containment. Um, the night that the Mittler Rebbe passed away, the Mittler Rebbe did this in public, and the Hasidim became hysterical, they panicked. But during the course of his 54 years, he did it many times in private. In fact, whenever the middle of Rebbe Davan, there would be this kind of dvekas. So like many of the Chabad Rebbes, the middle of Rebbe had chosen a shamish, a servant, who was, for lack of better words, short on the marbles. And they wanted that way. They didn't want people who were very close to them to be very aware, so it was perfect. And this particular shamish had a business on the side. His business on the side was that for a fee, he would show you the middle of Rebbe Davening. The scene of the middle of Rebbe Davening was most extraordinary. He would stand in the middle of the room, completely motionless. The middle of Rebbe was a Rebbe who hated his spoilers. He wanted his Hasidim to be non-demonstrative, let alone himself. With his eyes open and completely not aware. So the story goes that the Shamesh would you'd pay him a ruble, whatever it was, he'd take him into the middle of the Rebbe's office, he'd walk over to the Rebbe who was facing away, he would pick him up and turn him around so that the Rebbe was facing you, you would look at the Rebbe, and of course the first time you witnessed this, you would become hysterical and say, what kind of chutzpah, what kind of nerve, and the Shamesh would say, don't worry, I'm not bothering him, he has no idea. And after you stood there and watched the Rebbe for a few minutes, you would pick him up and turn him back around, and you would leave the room. I'm not trying to Hashem, trivialize the question of respect, but I'm trying to bring out the point that this was a person who stood in the state of Vegas where his body was completely still and his spiritual connection to what was outside of the body was incredible, infinite. The Rebbe himself, by a Fabrengen, on more than one occasion, described the middle Rebbe on Yom Kippur between Mincha and Ila. Yom Kippur in the afternoon, he would put on his hat, his streimel, and the middle Rebbe Streimel was like you see in the pictures of the Tzemach Tzedek. It was a cone shape, it was a pointed Streimel. He put on his Streimel. When I take like the hand of a hand, he put one hand up at the other. And he sit, sat completely motionless, totally still. And for the tip of this pointed hat, sweat was pouring like a fountain. So the Rebbe says, try to fathom what kind of intense intellectual space 
the Rebbe was in that he was perspiring like this. He was sweating profusely and his body was not budging. Now, of course, you've heard the story about our Rebbe, which is it's an interesting story that is told by Chesed Halbesh Tamzazan Gezunt, who was called by the Rebbe in the middle of the night because she got stuck in the elevator in the house. They had an elevator put in for the Rebbe and then she got stuck. And he came to the house and the door was double locked. They couldn't get into the house. They so had to climb in through a window. And the only window that was open was in the bedroom. And when he takes a ladder and he climbs up to the window, the Rebbe is standing by the window looking out. So he tried to get the Rebbe's attention. So goes the story. And the Rebbe was completely non-responsive. So he climbed in the window. The Rebbe was standing right there and he slipped past the Rebbe. He went and he helped the Rebbe out of the elevator and he left the house, he took away the ladder. And uh, it was the only window in the house that was open. And the next day he approached the Rebbe and apologized. And the Rebbe asked him for what? He had no idea. This is a, a very high level of attachedness, dvekis, connection. But what's so remarkable about it is that notwithstanding how intense it is, there's no evidence of it. It's all on the inside. In the world of Hasidus, this is hispilus versus dvekus. Hispilus, responsiveness, re combustibility, passion, versus quiescence, depth, quiet. It's a nice little story as an aside. Somebody once asked the Alter Rebbe when he saw the Baal Shemte for the first time. The Alter Rebbe never met the Baal Shemte physically, except by his upshot and by his haircut at the age of three. But we know of a number of occasions when the Alter Rebbe met the Baal Shemte, for example, when he was in jail and so forth. So somebody once asked the Alter Rebbe, when was the first time he saw the Baal Shemte? He said, the first time he saw the Baal Shemte, Bahakits, awake physically, in other words, when he was aware of a physical presence, although the Baal Shemte had already passed away, was by the Mezitcher Magid. And he related that he had resolved, he had made a decision that he wants to be a Meshodes, a servant of the Rebbe. What's a Meshodes? You were the Rebbe all the time. So he shadowed the Mezitcher Magid. He shadowed him, he was with him all the time. It was a Shana Rabbe, and they were sitting in the sukkah, and suddenly the Mezitcher Magid says to the Alter Rebbe to lock the door. And he locks the door, and then the Magid says these words, be internal and not reactionary. Be collected and not responsive, not reaction, reactive. The Rebbe is coming. And the Rebbe saw the Baal Shem Tev. I, I mentioned the story to bring out this point of when you experience something extraordinary, there is a notion of passion, and there's a notion of what is beyond passion. Keeping it together, as it were. It's Yashvas. I, I, I recall telling you in an earlier class about the Rebbe Rashab's last words. When the Rebbe Rashab was laying on his Eretz Devoy, in his deathbed, and his son, the Friedrich Rebbe, walked over and became very emotional, became hysterical. He started to scream, Tate, Tate, Father, Father. And the Rebbe Rashab opens his eyes. He looks at the Friedrich Rebbe. And he says, his spoilers, his spoilers, moichen, moichen. And he smiled. And I think those were his very last words, which means reaction, passion, mind, mind, meaning to say, keep it together. Keep the emotions on the inside. And the, the Hasidim say, I think perhaps the Rebbe also said that this little comment of the Rebbe Nishma Seydin raised the previous Rebbe to a much higher level. That's the context of the question I'm asking you. Is passion a good thing or a bad thing, or does it depend? Now, in philosophy, in Hasidic philosophy, the Hebrew terms for passion and what is beyond passion is murgash and bilti murgash. A passionate experience of a relationship with God and a deep, quiescent relationship with God. And the reality is, the truth of the matter is, that a passionate relationship with God is a symptom of an inefficiency in the relationship. A quiet and deep and internal relationship with God, which is actually very, very intense, but not demonstrative, not passionate on the outside, is because the relationship is perfect. 
And I'll illustrate it to you, and I believe I've already shared this thought with you on a previous occasion, by discussing two fires that burnt in the Beis HaMikdash. There was the fire of the Mizbeach and the fire of the Menorah. The fire of the Mizbeach burnt wood and meat. Now the wood was treated, the wood was sat in a storehouse for a few years, it was dry as paper, and it was made, you know, there was no moisture in it, and there was no worms and so forth. But nevertheless, it's wood, which means to say that it has a, a certain percentage of, of moisture. If it didn't have any moisture, it would fall apart. And meat, fresh meat, is you know, a very high percentage of water. The fire of the Mizbech was incredibly hot. They had incredible volume amounts of wood that were fed to this fire to keep it heat hot. It's interesting, there was no coal, just wood. And as the, as the Chazal tell us, the wood was actually pieces of plywood. They didn't have logs. They were amalama. They were square pieces of plywood, the shape of a tile, uh, about a etzba thick, about a half an inch thick. It means to say it would catch fire very quickly, so they had to use enormous quantities of wood. The Gemara says that you need to have, I think, 70 measures of wood to burn one measure of food. The Gemara says in Masech that, the, uh, that you know, to provide fuel for Yerushalayim for 22 years was a greater accomplishment than to provide wine and oil and wheat and so forth. Because you need so much more. And the fire was incredibly hot. And naturally, when you throw fresh meat onto the fire, it begins to dry. Then it dries out completely, and eventually it becomes carbon, and it burns, and it's consumed, and it's gone. But in the process, it crackles and it pops and it whistles and it steams, it's a lot of smoke. And the fire can actually be so dynamic that things can be physically thrown from the flame. All of this noise and this crackling and popping and whistling and whizzing are because of moisture. Moisture is incompatible with fire. There's in effect a fight going on and it is that struggle that produces all the dynamism. As the meat dries, the fire becomes hotter and quieter. Alternatively, the menorah also had a fire, but it was burning olive oil, pure olive oil. Olive oil almost wants to burn. And the fire is so peaceful and so quiet and so without dynamism, noise, because it's a much more harmonious coming together of flame and fuel. So murgash and built in murgash, passion and beyond passion, have to do with one's station. In other words, if a person's on a level where they are imperfect, if they are to have a relationship with God, it must be passionate. If a person's on a higher level, on a deeper level, where they have tr- perfected themselves, if you will, they can have a relationship with Hashem which is very intense and very deep, and yet on the outside is completely quiet. In its most ideal context, this question of Murgash and Bilti Murgash is considered in Kabbalah and Hasidus pre and post Eitz Adas, prior and subsequent to the original sin of Benin from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve and Gan Eden um, were beyond passion. They were totally intimate with God in a completely quiescent way, and they didn't experience things in a passionate way. Subsequent to the eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, so as we all know, they didn't just know good and evil, they became good and evil internally, within themselves. Consequently, their subsequent relationships with Hashem are going to be passionate. And that's how the Kabbalah explains Noach's drunkenness. He was trying to correct Murgish and he failed, and, uh, and so forth, and how Sada succeeded in elevating also the level of Murgish. So, when you ask the question, is passion good, bad, or it depends, all three answers are true. Unnecessary passion. Um, showy passion. Passion for the purpose of just feeling is not good. Because it's certainly preferred for a person to be in a deeper space than in a shallower space, a more connected space to a more showy space. And if a person doesn't need the passion and has the passion, it's unnecessary, it's redundant, it's bad. The passion is also good, which means to say if we're compromised, if we're deficient, and Without that passion, there's no relationship. You know, some of us are great intellectuals. We don't get excited. And as a result, we're called fish. We have no connection to God. When we need passion, we must have passion. In fact, in the Maimorim of Amalek, the previous Rebbe and the Rebbe Rashab, Samach He, and, and, and Pezayin, as you know, uh, mentions that one of the Amaleks is Mr. Cool. I, I'm too sophisticated, too intellectual, too exalted, too lofty, too sublime to allow myself to get excited about God. And when one needs that excitement for the connection 
and doesn't have that excitement in the connection, they have no connection. So then the passion becomes a very good thing. But is there a third possibility? Can it be that one doesn't need passion and yet there should be a use and a purpose in that passion? Let's leave this question unanswered, okay? And I'll do what I do best, which is repeat myself. Passion can be bad. If a person is unnecessarily showy and superficial, it's not good. Passion can be very important. If I am a person who struggles with spirituality, and in order for me to feel spiritually connected, I gotta really, so to speak, I gotta charge up all the engines and make everything in overdrive to feel, that becomes a good thing. But there's a third possibility that it may not need the passion, and yet the passion may serve a purpose still. And let, let's wait and see if we can get to that point in this mind, because that's the issue of this mind, the necessity for passion and its role on a personal level, but also on a, on a purpose level, in terms of what God wants out of the creation. Kabbalah tells us, Hasidus brings, Ka'ani b'chashoyu uber'usa d'liba. Koyhanim that are considered higher than Leviim, their entire role was to have a connection to Hashem, very strong, very deep, but very quiet. Leviim, on the other hand, are the Madrig of Bina, or Gvura, and the trademark of the Avoida of Alevi is called Ahava Aza Kirish Bayesh, an intense love like Kirish Bayesh. Kirish Bayesh means fire attached to coal, not fire inside coal, fire that's outside of the coal, which means passion that's demonstrated on the outside. And that's what this moment is about. Levim and their passion and the message, the teaching, the lesson we learn from this notion that Hashem wants there to be Levim, that Levim should be passionate. And yes, there is even an idea where a person is going to experience passion in a demonstrative way where personally they don't need it. They can be beyond it, and yet there is a need to descend from the dispassionate depth to the passionate demonstration because there is a role in excitement and in passion that although passion, murgash, is a lower level than dispassion, built in murgash, it serves a vital purpose. And as you'll see in this Maimed, it justifies an Hashem coming into this world altogether. So let's get to the Maimed itself. Let's start. Line one. The Avad HaLevi Hu. The Levi will also serve God. Of course, Kairach, the whole passage of Kairach is about Levi. Kairach was a Levi. He made trouble. He wanted to be a Kain Gadol. And the whole rest of the Pasha discusses that the Kainim and the Levi have to collaborate to honor the Beis HaMikdash and also to shield Yidin from the fire, the holiness, the potency of the Beis HaMikdash. The Kainim have a more internal world role, and Levim have a more peripheral role, but together they share the responsibility for Shmita, guarding the base of both in terms of honor and preserving the Jewish nation and so forth. So the Taylor says, over the Levi who? That the Levi also is a servant of God. But the word who is extra. It would have been perfectly sufficient as the Pasuk said, over the Levi. So there's so much Hasidus in Kabbalah, you have it also in Tanya chapter 50, which I've talked about a number of times. This word who? Says the Rabbi Pirush. This word who? Indicates, says, the function of a levi is laham who, to bring forward that level, which is called who shall be which is level of understanding, which is intellectual, which is still concealed al almadis that it should come forward. In simple English, the role of the levi is to take the quiescent depth and bring it down to a level of demonstrative passion. The word who means him. Now all of us know this first person, second person, and third person. First person is a ni, I. Second person is a ta, or at, you. And who or he means he or she. So the allusion to him is indirect. In the word him itself, we don't even know who him is. We just know that him is something other. And of course, in Hasidus, when they talk about, for example, Atahu Hashem, Ata is second person, who is third person, and Hashem is whatever Hashem is. And they always interpret the word who as representing the sublime. God as he's concealed. Because we're not saying you, which is God as he's available, overt in our presence. We're saying him, uh, forgive me for saying this, or it, the unknown. 
So the word who connotes concealed godliness. So the of the levi who the levi must work over the hidden godliness and make it revealed. And as I explained it to you a moment before, this means to make a connection which is beyond passion, passionate. Va'inyan continues the Rebbe on line three, and he explains it. It requires that we first explain the difference between using the Chochma part of the brain and the Bina part of the brain. Now, I don't want to give you long lectures on Chochma and Bina, there'll be other opportunities. But a short lecture on Chochma and Bina. Chochma is the creative part of the mind. I guess some people would call it the, the right side of the brain. And... Um, the creative part of the mind is intuitive. It, it comes up with a, a lot of very original thoughts that are not yet fully developed. But part of the chokhma property of creativity and intuition is vision. The chokhma has a sense of what's beyond, and it is that sense of what's beyond, that internal sense of vision, that's the basis for its creativity and its intuition. So the intellectual tool of chokhma is viewed as a deep and a quiet tool. Which means to say, if you are the kind of human being who have the intellectual depth and fortitude to use your Chochmah mind by itself, you would have the capacity to intellectually pursue, thing, pursue things in a very, very fine and abstract way. Not need to analyze them, not need to open them up, not need to dissect them. But there would be something very, very enchanting and drawing in. In other words, when a person is engaged in the use of the Chochmah mind, there's a depth and there's a quiescence. While the Bina mind is an analytical and departmentalizing and dissecting, it's opening up. So the Bina mind involves the ego, the Bina mind involves excitement and expression and detail. It says that I have a Pinoch. Moich and the Abba, the mind of Chochma, who begins Hasogas Habitl, is a form of intellectually relating that is all about humility. Intellectually, I'm humbling myself to what is beyond me. So there's a quiescence, there's a quietness in that process, which is Bebchinas Chochma, which is the attribute of Chochma, which means humility and Bittl. Shu Bechinas Koyachma, it's the possibility to be humble, to quiet one's conscious to open themselves up to their subconscious and so forth. And in the biblical form, V'nachnu ma, Aaron Moshe says about us, Aaron and Moshe, we are ma, we are bittal, we are quiet in our openness to the transcendent, what is beyond us, namely God. And the form of this type of use of the mind, which is we are naturally open to what is beyond you, Yeshua B'chinas Kritos, on the outside it's cold. And the reason it's cold is because you're so enchanted, so drawn into what is above you, that there's no passion on the outside, there's no demonstrative passion. Which is the higher kind of fear, the fear of being in the presence of Hashem, which quiets you out of shame, out of humility, out of quiescence. Which is the notion that Chochmah is itself called Ayin, in other words, Tachas Explain, let's just interpret it this way. We have an intellectual tool that allows us to see ideas, visualize ideas. I don't think you should presume that this means to visualize like you would a piece of art. It's an intellectual kind of a visualization. But what happens when someone sees something is that they're enchanted and stunned, quiet. That's how Chochmah functions. So when an intellectual using the Mecha Chochmah finds himself in a state of upliftedness, transcendence, quiet, deep, fully engaged, and doesn't have the need to control the idea. He can afford to be lost to the idea. On the other hand, line five. The intellectual tool of Bina is This is the notion of using the intellectual tool that's all about the ego. When you're using the tool that's all about the ego, that's not about humbling myself, subjugating myself, sublimating myself to the idea. It's bringing the idea to me where I want to control it. If I want to control it, I want to be stronger than it. I want to dissect it. I want to open it up. There's ego, there's form, there's passion, there's expression. Which is the notion, that one has an inspiration, intellectual inspiration of the greatness of God, to a state of full comprehension. You're not 
allowing godliness to take you in. You are bringing godliness into your mind. You're analyzing it. You're departmentalizing it. And you're processing it. And one understands intellectually on this level, where they bring it down and they give it a lot of words and a lot of form. The consequence of this kind of understanding is midas ava azo, a fiery passion which is experienced on the outside, begivures with strength. Rishpeyesh. Rishpeyesh means like hot coals, very very hot, very intense, but that the fire is on the outside. And love is barach God Almighty. So. Let's say this, you know, we grew up with yeshiva, you know, part of the rhetoric, part of the, the language which we were acclimated to was halbosha and afshata, two kinds of intellectuals. One kind of intellectual has to analyze everything and break it down, and the other kind of intellectual can visualize, can relate to things in theoretical terms, in abstract terms, in fine terms. It doesn't need to wordify, to give uh, much uh, verbal detail and handle and control to the idea that one is wishing to comprehend. And this is the difference between the intellectual tool of Chachma and the intellectual tool of Bina. Now one of the symptoms of this is, for a lot of people Chachma is very hard, because Chachma means I'm understanding something without controlling it. T to use classic uh, learning form, a Chacham doesn't, ne doesn't need to say, in other words, Chochmah is able to listen to the way it was given and he raises himself to it. And there's a quiescence in that. Bina needs to say it in other words, needs to handle it, needs to grasp it, needs to feel like they own it and control it. There's an ego in that, there's form in that. And the difference is on the emotional plane. One who is intellectually able to function on the Chochmah level, their emotions are also very deep, very quiet. One who functions on the Bina level, when they get aroused about what they understood, which is God, that excitement is on the outside. So, is passion good or bad, or does it depend? Of course, the short answer to that question is, if you don't need Bina and you employ Bina, it's bad. If you need Bina and employ Bina, it's wonderful. But is there another answer? And we continue. When we dive in, we need both of these. We need passion. Boy, do we need passion. Because if we have passion, we have nothing. But we also need humility. Because if we have no humility, our passion can become literally the worship of ourselves. We get so excited about God, we invent a God that's comfortable to our passion. You need the humility. You need the combination. You need both intellectual tool of Chochmah, which is deep and quiet and drawing in, intellectual tool of Bina, which is thorough, analytical, and bringing forward. Pirush, this means... Shabrin as Maich and the Amo one is davening, using the intellectual tool of analyzing and dissecting and bringing down Hubachin Nisratzu. That's the passionate rush towards God. It's almost as if we make godliness a selfish exercise, a self serving idea. They call the to become embraced in godliness, I the Ava Allah, to this incredibly demonstrative passion. Kishalhev is like a fire, a flame. Hanel, which comes forward, may ha his bonan us bit lost his bonach by thoroughly and in detail contemplating the greatness of God Almighty, Shubachinis Maich and the Aim by the intellectual tool of Bina. Ki aim la bina tikari. There's a link between mother and bina, an understanding. And of course, mother means children, the children of the passions. Shemizah Yebachim Satsakana, which creates a rush, a passionate and urgent rush towards godliness. But you also need humility. The intellectual tool of Chachma that doesn't need to analyze and to handle and to gain control but can open themselves up to the idea and be raised up into it. It actually happens after Chachma, after Bina. In other words, in Ishtasos Chachma is before Bina but in the human experience it's beyond. After my passion there's a humility which quiets my passion so my passion should remain loyal to the purpose. Like it says in the Sefer Yitzira, V'imrat Lipcha, if you get too carried away, Shoiv L'Echad, settle with the oneness of God, the humility of Chach. Shizawa Bechinus Yiri Allah, which is the higher form of fear. The higher form of fear is the way you go quiet when you stand in the presence of God. Yira Beishis, a fear associated with shame. Shu Bechinus Maich and the Abba, it's intellectual tool of Abba, of Chach, in other words. Shemakab Allah V'amachashmaim. That from the humility of Chach, you submit. From the intellectual and passions associated with Bina, you also serve God, but it's all based on ego. 
from the intellectual tool of Chochmah and the emotions that are as quiet as Chochmah that radiate from that Chochmah, you have Kabbalah cell, humility. Now, I just want to mention that the, the bitl, the Kabbalah cell of Chochmah, is very different than the Kabbalah cell of Malchus. Leave that for experts and for another occasion. Says the Reb. So, some people need passion. Some people don't need passion. If you need passion, you have to have passion. If you're not going to have a connection to God unless you get yourself excited, you better get yourself excited and stop worrying about how you look and stop worrying about people telling you you're not a Chabadnik, you're a Polish, like somebody once told me. You're too excited, too emotional. If you need passion, you must have passion. You have to control the passion, you have to direct the passion. If you don't need passion, passion for you becomes a negative thing. But is there a third possibility? So let me tell you a story I've told you before. The Heilu Kirushinu was about seven. He met the Alta Rebbe, who was the Talmud of his Zayde and his Elta Zayde. The Rishonu was the grandson of the Holy Malach, Holy Angel, and the great grandson of the Holy Magid of Mizrich, who was Alta Rebbe's Rebbe. So Alta Rebbe was very, very interested in meeting the grandson and great grandson of his Rebbe, especially since he was an orphan. And Alta Rebbe met this little boy. And the Rujanan asked Al Tarebbe when a Yid says, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alakin, Hashem Achad, how can he say Vyahafta? The one declares the unity of God, how can you follow that up by a statement of love? So the Al Tarebbe answered, because in between you insert Borah Shaykh Ben Mechosel Elevod. This is the story. Al Tarebbe walked out of the wagon, or the Rujanan left. Al Tarebbe turns to his Hasidu and he says, This little boy just asked a question that's beyond your comprehension. You don't even understand what the exchange was. And he explained, or the explanation is known. The one says, Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad, there's nothing from God, but God, that is a bittle of Chochmah. It's a recognition of the truth of Hashem on a level which is beyond passion. There's no ego, just quiescence. But you have to love. Love is passion, love is ego. How do you go from the declaration, Hashem Echad, there's nothing but God, which humbles and quiets to the point that there is, in effect, no you, to the excitement of your hafta? It's a dichotomy. It's a conflict. And the answer is, you say in the interim, which is a lower level of unity. Which means, in other words, you're actually stepping away from the dveikus of Chochmah to create a Hispilus of Bina, which is the third possibility. Even a person, who at least in theory, has the capacity to be beyond passion because they're so fine and so sensitized and so tuned in, there is a place for such a person to step away from their dispassion, to descend, to go down to the place we have to analyze and open up and experience real passion. V'yahavto. And the statement, Baruch Shem Kaved Machos that for most of us is recited so that our statement of Shema should simply be honest and not fantastic, is for some people going down from Hashem Echad to Shem Kaved Machos so that they can create the possibility for a lower kind of unity, a lower kind of comprehension of God, and experience passion. Now, why would somebody want to do that? And of course, the answer is, that's what God wants. Vehine, line 14. although it's true, that actual tool of Chochmah is deeper and quieter, more attached, more connected, than the intellectual tool of understanding, which is passionate and demonstrative. Still, it becomes necessary to step away from the more sublime level to the more manifest, external, passionate level because it's what God wants. Bitchila first. Yan, and here's why. The reason God made us, who it is to illuminate as a goof our body. And when a person experiences a connection to God without passion, they're simply trans- they're transcending, they're going beyond it beyond the body, beyond the animal soul. Some people can do it. Some people are pure enough to do it. But they're not raising it up. But God wants, He gave us a body not to escape from it, but to transform it. He gave us an animal soul not to escape from it, but to transform it. So God says to that individual, who has the capacity to experience genuine and credible and with integrity, attachedness to Hashem in a dispassionate way, step away from a dispassion, create passion, because that touches your body and your animal soul. And that's what God created us, with a body and an animal soul. The who? And this is achieved, I have only in one experience of love, Shebegili, which is demonstrated on the outside, Hanim Shechmei which only happens when you intellectually approach God in a more thorough, analytical way. 
because Jakarta of Yesel Haguf, the analytical, ego-based, intellectual approach where you have to handle the ideas and control the ideas, it's closer to the body. Ki chachma meichel bino liba. Because Kabbalistically, chachma is more connected to the intellect. And bino, although it's an intellectual tool, is more connected to the emotions. Vahalev kar v'yesel aguf, the heart is close to the body. Like it says, Tanya chapter 16. Obechin as meichel and the abba, an intellectual tool of chachma. Av shamalah aslam gavaya yesem ya bino. Although chachma is higher than bino, it's more sublime, it's deeper. But argues al tadeh, but chachma doesn't get you in touch with the truth anyway. Haloi, the truth of the matter is, ain't say, but who will not let Jason? Infinity, godliness, and God are beyond, no matter how deep our quiescence and our intellectual in tuneness may be, God is beyond that. In an incomparable way. And we all know, no intellectual, no choch, with the deepest and strongest and purest mind is going to grasp the truth of Hashem. And therefore, you are said, step away from the superiority of Chochmah to the more earthy experience of Bina, because this educates the body and the animal soul and fulfills the purpose. Cain, the marshal, correspondingly, Begin, as Meich and the intellectual tool of Chochmah. Sha'ava, Sham Behelm, the love is deep. It's experienced, but it's deep and quiet. Shu'inayla, Betana Yesis, further remove from us, skip the parenthesis. Line 19. And as lofty as the passions that come from Chochmah may be, it doesn't fulfill the purpose. And therefore, one of the things we must do when we dive in is arouse ourselves emotionally. May I help them from hidden to a revealed state? To illuminate the body. Skip the parenthesis. This is achieved through contemplating on a more analytical and lower level, the intellectual level of Bino which means to understand thoroughly and to analyze and to incorporate the ego into that process. Sheh HaMalad is Abonim, which gives birth to children, offspring. Sheh HaAhav, of Chalam Midas, which is love and all the remaining emotions as they're experienced passionately and externally, HaKadosh that are holy. So, the Mayim says, even if you are above passion, descend to the level of passion so you'll raise up your body. That's why God created us, and that's why God put us here. So the answer to the question is passion, good, bad, or it depends, is all three. And finally, after you've descended to the level of passion, you reinvest your intellectual tool of Chochmah, which humbles, but you have to have the passion. I'm reminded, I think it's in the Sefer HaNagunim. The Sefer HaNagunim has a very good introduction. And um, by many Nagunim, there's a little commentary. One of the Nagunim is from the Tzemach Tzedek. It's called Hedeni Hashem Kitsi. It's capital Lamed Zion, I believe. And, oh, or Lamates. And uh, the story behind the Yeni Hashem Kitsi is that it was Sukkot. And the Hasidim heard that the Tzemach Tzedek was saying, till him in the Sukkah. So they stood outside the Tzemach Tzedek Sukkah, and there was a Haruf Gedrapet. They climbed up on the walls of the Sukkah, and they leaned over the Schach to listen to the Tzemach Tzedek say, till him. And they heard one Pasuk, Yeni Hashem Kitsi, which is a Chabad Tnuah, people sing it. And then the Rebetzin, Chaim Mushka, came around the bend, and she started to sh- shout at them, Vos! Never saw Yitz say Tillam, and she sent him flying. And there's a story or a comment associated with this episode. Now, that the Tzemach Tzedek said of himself, Ich ken alt, I can do everything. Ich ken afilu zogn Tillam via Yishposh. I could even say Tillam like a simple Jew. And it's known that Tzemach Tzedek could recite Psalms, Tillam, with tears pouring out of his eyes, with incredible emotion that in six hours he would finish one capital. In other words, this holy, deep Rebbe could descend into the, into the very, very, very uh, throes, most complete form, body of excitement and passion, because it raises up the world. Now, in case of a Rebbe, I'm sure there's other business, but in the case of this moment, we all understand what this is saying. It says, the Rebbe, line 24, V'zeh hoya ha'medes that was the Levim's role. In the base of Mikdash, the Koyanim were deep. The Levim were demonstrative. The Koyanim were engaged, and the Levim were excited. And that excitement, I would imagine, spilled over to everybody who visited. The Ksiv of the Levi who, the job of a Levi is to work over the who, to make the hidden revealed. Pirush. In other words, Shekol, Avedasam, Hoya, their function was. Lahoi, Tziyamidis, Av, to bring forward the passions of love and fear. 
that in the Kayin's world are so deep they show no expression. From the hidden who state, Alma Diskasi, which is concealed, the Lagil, that it should be demonstrated. How did the Levim do this? By not being drawn into the experience of godliness, but by analyzing and trying to gain control and adding form and words to the experience of godliness, which they could bring into their own person, their own ego. Is, me and Ela is Elikim. The letters Mem Yud and then Aleph Lamed Hey is, of course, Shem Elikim. The difference is me, which is 50, is the hidden part of Shem Elikim, Bina. And Ela, which is 36, which goes on Za, is the revealed part. Ela means this, me means I don't know what, what. So Elikim is a combination of the hidden and the revealed. So who would be me, the Gilev who would be Ela, and that's the function of the Levi. That's what they would sing, and the sing had to be out loud. It had to be beautiful. First of all, Bepeh, Bekeh, Bezimra, they would sing words and song, and Bekli, as well as with uh, musical instruments. And this was, of course, meant to be beautiful and demonstrative and aesthetically appealing. Says the Rebbe, line 27, Yesh Kama Kalos, all different types of musical instruments, which cause us the Pasuk Zalu, but take a shafer, there's this blowing of the shafer, Halu, but navel, there's the blowing of an instrument called navel, and kine, which is another musical instrument, Halu, but taif, taif is a, also a musical instrument, the mochel means to dance, the whole. Fine, in other words, Yesh Kama, Mine, Hislahav, Shabi, Hisgalas. There are various different types of expressing external passion. Yes, of Islavas is a thirst and a passion, which is Mechina Simcha Vechadva, which is joyous and glad. Vyashi Mechina Smarida Vlaid Nishma. Some of music, or perhaps most of music, is bitter and melancholy. But the nature of the passions of music is that they're on the outside. Nobody has to tell you that. The very nature of music is. It is an expression of passion and it brings out passion. Right? That's why we all love music. That's why we, especially when we're younger, love the music to be loud and surrounding and consuming us. We want to feel it. That's murgash, passion. But we have to turn the, those passions to God. And correspond with different kind of musical instruments. There's also the sound of the shafer. The shafer, the sound of the shafer, that imposes trepidation. nishbor and a brokenheartedness, which is the sound of the shoifer of Ashvarim, and the broken sounds of the shoifer. The symbols of teruah, which is another sound of the shoifer. They too correspond to a passion, which is demonstrative, which is which the bitterness and a broken heart. Which means a flute. is a musical instrument that arouses joy. It corresponds to love and passion, which, which comes from and arouses uh, joy. Now, I want to just throw an idea in, which is brought in Mamari Hasidus, that there's a difference between musical instruments and the sound of the shoifer, and that is the sound of the shoifer is melodic. It's not beautiful. And the Hasidus for this, of course, is that the shoifer is higher than uh, uh, beauty. It's a raw cry. So musical instruments are very rich and very sophisticated, but they are also very orderly, because, so to speak, in a way, the mind is controlling the art form. The shoifer is a cry which is uncontrollable. But as far as this moment is concerned, what they have in common is passion. It says, This is what the Levim used their musical instruments for, but common meaning of various types. Shakelu, all of it is lave to work over, to bring forward. Es pechinas hu that the concealed should be revealed, that Bechinas hu asonu, the fact that the Ebishter in a hidden state created us, should be laham sheikh hamides mehelam alagili, it should be brought forward from a hidden to a revealed state. And I have a recollection, and I actually looked for it, and I wasn't capable of finding it, but I think there's, in Abena Bechaya, my recollection is in Parshas Beshalach, maybe by Miriam, where he explains ten musical instruments, but I must say again that I didn't find it today. Ten musical instruments, and it corresponds them to the ten spheres and to all kinds of other, and to the to the ten spheres of the heavens that correspond to the seven planets that are in motion and the planets that are still and all the rest. He he, he aligns all of these ideas. In other words, it's about form and expression because that's the real world and the form, the expression of the real world, for some is stepping down, but it elevates the world.